When at a very early age we were introduced to the idea of numbers, we also quickly learn that numbers can be combined in various ways. And then we learn about addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. The sort of things we might want to do with our numbers are closely dictated by the sort of processes that we're interested in in the real world. Things like adding up money, or possibly as children, dividing lollies into equal amounts. If we progress to more advanced mathematics, then we meet new quantities other than numbers. Things like vectors, complex numbers, matrices, and even more sophisticated objects. Still though, we will usually need to apply processes to these new quantities. And the kind of processes we will want to apply depend on the applications that are being made. For example, when we meet vectors, we learn how to add them using a geometric diagram in which the tail of one vector sits on the head of the other. This tells us the net effect of following one vector then the other by connecting up the third side of the triangle, as shown here. We call this vector addition and we use a plus sign, but of course it's not really anything like adding numbers where we're just counting out things. In the case of vectors, we can introduce the idea of a negative in front of a vector by discussing the negative meaning reversal of direction. That then allows us to subtract vectors by saying that a minus b is a plus negative b. We then might ask, can we multiply vectors? Is it meaningful to talk about a product of two vectors? If it is meaningful, then how should we do it? And of course, we don't just make up a rule for a product at random. It has to be made up in a way that's consistent. And, almost always, a new rule for combining objects is dictated to us by the kind of applications that we want to use those objects in. I'm going to explain to you how the dot product comes about. I'm going to draw on a simple example from physics. Imagine a force moving an object. Let's suppose that the force moves the object parallel to itself, that is, in the same direction as the force. Here's a picture. I've got a block at A, a force with magnitude F acting on the block, and it moves it to B, which is a distance D away. Although there are arrows in this picture, there are not yet any vectors. The arrows are simply indicating a direction in which the force acts. A study of the physics of this situation, some centuries ago, told people that it was a useful concept to discuss the work done by the force. The work done, that is the energy expended, in moving the object from A to B, turns out to be given by a product of the magnitude of the force times the distance moved. That would be F times D in this example. So we can say that W equals FD. And here we're talking about multiplication of two numerical quantities. There are no vectors involved at this point. So that's normal number multiplication, scalar multiplication. Now I want to change this physical situation a little. I want to imagine that the object is actually sitting on a surface, perhaps a table, and that the force is now no longer pushing parallel to the direction to the to the surface of the table but actually is at an angle to the table the result of course is still that the object moves and we'll still have it moving from a to b but now the force is slanting away from the table i've redrawn this situation here and i've put in a magnitude for the angle between the direction of the force and the surface on which the object is lying i've called that angle theta We'll assume that the table is very smooth, so there's no complication of having to worry about friction and so on. This time the situation is a little bit different. The force has a component that acts along the direction of the table, but also a component that acts perpendicularly at right angles to the table. We could draw a picture that shows the force resolved or broken up in that way. It's useful to think of this as a vector addition f equals f1 plus f2 
using head to tail addition of F2 to F1. Let's put in the angle again, theta. The part of the force that is doing the work, moving the object from A to B, is now not the whole of F, but only the part of F pointing along the direction of AB. That's the part F2. F2 has a magnitude. In fact, we can use simple trigonometry to state that the magnitude of F2 is the magnitude of F times cos of the angle, theta. It's that F2 part that it does the work on the object moving it from A to B. So when we calculate the work, we now have to multiply the distance moved D, not by the magnitude of F, but by the magnitude of F2. But then we can replace the magnitude of F2 with magnitude of F times cos theta. Finally, to give a full vector picture, if we think of the line segment from A to B as being the vector AB, then D is just its magnitude. So for the work, we end up with the expression W equals magnitude of F times magnitude of AB times cos of the angle between the directions of F and AB. This quantity is a product made up with the two vectors F and AB. It's not just a product, but it is in particular a product which happens to be a scalar quantity, a pure number. It has no direction. Earlier on in history, as people started to understand more and more physics and engineering, quantities like this cropped up all the time in physics and engineering. Quantities that involve the product of two magnitudes of two vectors times the cosine of the angle between them. It therefore made sense to refer to this quantity as the product of the two vectors. Because it's a scalar, it is called the scalar product. Of course, we also need some notation to indicate this product, and people use the dot. So we now write f dot ab is equal to this quantity. More generally, although this particular product came from the study of work with forces acting on objects, we can abstract the idea of the product and talk about the product of two vectors in general, defined in this way. For example, if the vectors are u and v, then we have the dot product between u and v. In doing this, the product has taken on a life of its own, independently of the examples from which it originally arose. However, armed with this definition of the dot product, we find that it can be used in many different circumstances where vectors arise. It is therefore a useful thing to do, and a sensible way of defining the product. However, I should be careful. I keep saying the product, but actually this is just one particular product that can be made from two vectors. It turns out there are other kinds of application in science and engineering where an alternative version of the product is used. That one is called the cross product. It turns out that the cross product is actually a vector, not a scalar. And so we distinguish it from the dot product by using a cross and remembering that it is a vector. That's another story that we'll have to investigate elsewhere. One final comment. Very often when we have vectors, we know their components in the x, y and z directions. We do not necessarily always know the angle between them. That means that having a cos theta in our expressions can be inconvenient. It means that we need to look at the dot product and see if there's another way of writing it way not involving the angle. Well, that's another story as well, and I don't have time to go into it here. So for now, I just want to emphasize the dot product of two vectors is written with a dot between them, and the result is a scalar, a pure number, not a vector. The dot product is also called the scalar product. That concludes my presentation.